All right, so uh, thanks to all the speakers so far. I think it's going um, exactly how we uh, expected, but I wanted to explore a little bit more of this intertwined history of Moore's Law uh, and the role of government investment, specifically uh, DARPA. But the other thing I'm gonna do, right, is an open love letter to Gordon Moore, right? Just unabashedly just say, this man that I've never met, and to be honest, we've never even been in the same meeting, uh, but I've grown to have so much respect uh, for his writings and the guidance that uh, he has provided. I literally was a skeptic when I was like, you know, Moore's law is overstated. He had a simple observation, right? And then everything happened after he made that observation and how come he's getting all of the credit? And then I looked deeper and deeper and the more insightful that he actually became. And I'm gonna try to convince you that his words he spoke on uh, uh, the basics of uh, what he gets credit for were insightful, uh, but actually what the moment we're living in right now is where he has true prescience. So he changed the world. Uh, he made a simple observation, which by now everybody uh, here probably knows, but it's worth repeating. Right? It, he basically said in very colloquial language, right, we're gonna cram more components into integrated circuits and that uh, in very plain language said cramming is the future, or we're at least gonna cram until right, yield gets in our way. But that curve, the bathtub curve, is going to move as a function of time. And he described this one-way trade space. It doesn't really exist in engineering in almost any other field. Smaller is better. Smaller is lower cost, as he shows through this graph, but smaller actually is lower power you'll get more functionality, and we'll actually be able to use them faster. And that is actually an amazing observation, uh, but also an incredible stroke of luck that you can find a engineering uh, vector that is a one-way trade space. And it mattered, right? So this isn't Moore's Law. This actually gets shown as Moore's Law quite often, but it's not. It's the implication of Moore's Law. And I like to show this to people in another field and say, We've had some progress. And then they say, well, we've had progress too. Uh, every field has marched along with time. And then you point out that y-axis is a logarithmic, right? It's a log scale. It's a 53-year exponential. 53-year exponentials aren't supposed to exist. Right? And he even says, when I, he found out about ERI. He wrote and said, thank you for uh, what you're doing. Um, I never saw this actually. Right? He predicted all of 65,000 transistors in 1975. Right? That was what the paper actually culminated in. And he said, you know, that's going to, as far as we can predict. And after that, all bets uh, are off. And so it would have been crazy for him to predict a 53-year exponential because 53-year exponentials aren't supposed to exist in this world. Now, one reason I think it does exist and how he missed it, but if, you know, better people than me, have also predicted the demise over that 53-year cycle is uh, every time you march your way up this curve, you actually get better computing resources. Computing resources allow you to get better design tools to be able to both design the transistors and harness the complexity. And that is the definition of a feedback, right, where each node exists right, on top of the prior work and an exponential is born. In our country, created that exponential and harnessed that exponential better than any other country um, in the world and it's had broad impact. So we call this Moore's Law and it's really from the simple observation. I don't like calling it Moore's Law, even though I think that name is stuck, we're not gonna try to change it because a law right, is something that's going to happen whether we like it or not, right? You have to get in its way. You don't have to promote a law, right? It sort of sounds like it's you know, mundane that from this observation that we were able to this achievement. The other thing that he wrote uh, in response to what, when we kicked off is it's a testimony to the people right, that have knocked down these obstacles to make an observation into a law that makes this law the foundation of society that we have today that is actually part of public lexicon that people know what Moore's law is and it's not just because of Moore, it's because of the community as described 
it's Robert Kahn quitting his job at MIT to join the government to not only TCP IP, but create the Strategic Computing Initiative. It's Len Conway making the right decisions to create Moses, to break apart an industry, to show that a fabulous design industry can exist. It's Ivan Sutherland and, um, and Mead writing together in, in the 70s, reminding us it's all about wires, right? And allowing us to focus on the right uh, aspect uh, of the system. Uh, <clears throat> and it's Dan Raddick investing uh, in uh, Berkeley to create uh, the FinFET. From an observation to a law, it takes the right decisions and it takes the community uh, to execute flawlessly. The government, academia, and industry tripod that uh, this law is built on uh, is the prototype that all other research fields should aspire to. Right? So calling it a law belies the fact that the number of uh, right decisions and sacrifices people have made along the, law, uh, along the way uh, are what's key to actually existing as long as it has. And it matters. And it matters in a big way. And if you look from the national e economics impact, GDP growth over a two-decade period that we chose here was 85%. From the semiconductor field, it was 265%. Right? That matters in the everyday lives of people across uh, this country. It's the third largest export that we have um, as a natural good that we create right? and export to the rest of the world, third only to the automotive and aircraft sectors. And it's the single most high-tech field, right? And what I mean by high-tech field, more research goes on for every dollar that is created, more money goes back into the research community to stay ahead than any other field, including things like uh, pharmaceuticals. This has mattered. Right? Harnessing an exponential, a 50-year exponential that really shouldn't have existed in the world has been good for our country in ways that we really are just starting to appreciate. And of course, it has huge national security impact as well. If you look at any one of our systems that are the basis of our national security apparatus, you will find an incredibly intertwined network of heterogeneous electronic systems. Right, this is an early warning uh, system. Right? This allows us to know what's happening before everybody else knows what's happening. It senses the world. It processes that information. It disseminates that information to the people who need it before the rest of the uh, world will know. This is what keeps us safe at night. And at the uh, core of these types of systems, not just this, but any system, right, is uh, the processing uh, and the culmination right, of that 53-year exponential. But this is where the love letter starts. Everybody knows about uh, Moore's Law's observation on page two. In page three, he got even uh, wise. He gave us uh, clues to where we're at today. Uh, he said, these are the boundary conditions in which you should continue this race. Right? You're going to cram. You're going to get more and more components. You're going to use them up until uh, the ec economics start uh, causing you problems. He says the particular cost of a a system function must be minimized. It's an economic argument that he laid as the boundary conditions for when Moore's law will need something different. It doesn't mean the end of the road, I would say. We don't think Moore's law is stopping at all. It's going to go through uh, something different, and we all will experience that over the next 10 to 20 years. We go back one. All right, so um, what we were showing is we're at that moment. We're at a point in time where the fab, the design, the verification, the test and evaluation, and writing the software on top of a system on chip is more expensive uh, than ever. If it's an economic argument that he laid out as the boundary conditions we should start, uh, keep, uh, continue to scale, right, it's an economic pain that we're starting uh, to feel and actually talking to industry leaders throughout uh, yesterday, you could actually see how each company is starting to see this uh, personified inside of their choices that they're having to make. So he predicted cost, but I know he didn't predict the world we're living in right now, and it's 
priority. It's not as simple as just saying they're more expensive. We need to uh, do something different. Just on top of abstraction, uh, abstraction that has pushed the value chain up from the core of the semiconductor development right, into the software stack closer to the application. It is no secret that in venture capital today, right, they are hunting right, for big uh, return on investment that has translated to focusing at the software uh, level. And I don't blame them. Their job is to make money, and that's where money is being harvested. But the byproduct is uh, you aren't able to get funding for some of the core underlying underpinnings of the hardcore semiconductor problems. Computer science departments are exploding across our, department, our, our, our country, while electrical engineering departments are relatively flat. It's just an indication of the time um, that we live in. So abstraction means we're pushing the value elsewhere. A good opportunity for the government to step in right, to make sure some of the basics are tended to. Of course, other countries see that same opportunity. Foreign investments are an all-time high. You'll hear about $150 billion from China. Right? That is a number that is staggering and never actually been seen before in the history of the world. That much of a concentration and one technical field to poach the people who are in this auditorium right, and try to move the epicenter of electronics eastward right, is a challenge we've never faced before. Right? But it's not actually just the uh, state-driven investments. Right? You actually have a lot of foreign investment, or even private investment, right, that's having that same effect in trying to push the epicenter uh, of the electronics industry elsewhere. Now, of course, we are at a very unique time from a manufacturing perspective. We, as we sit right now, do not have access to the most advanced transistor node for the first time in the history of the transistor. When I say we, the DoD, cannot manufacture at 14 nanometers based on policy. It's the first time since Bell Labs invented the transistor to where we sit today that we have not had that luxury of modernizing to the most advanced capability. Right? The industry government relationship, which is the core of the electronics field and the development of the transistor, has broken. Right? And we need to bind that back together. It's one reason we are all here. And I, at the bottom here, this is very important, it's rising stakes. Right? It matters more than ever the choices that we make at the foundation of the stack. It is irresponsible for us to go chase performance only. Moore's law set us on a performance path. Right? We need to make sure that we're making the decisions right, that put security first. Security has to be first with performance following. Right? You cannot build a digital influence society at the level that we have where the foundation has cracks. You can't build cities on concrete that if you played the wrong music note, it would shatter. Right? You cannot do that in the electronics uh, domain. And so we need to invent. Right? At the exact same time, we need to uh, care about security at a level that we haven't in the past. So this is our unique moment in time. This is the legacy that we've been handed. This is our community Right, staring at challenges right, that are uh, very complex and multifold. So we go back right, to the master and say, you know, what should we be doing at this moment in time? He was really focused on cost, but his guidance actually applies across the stack. He says, right, it may prove more economical to build large systems out of smaller functions, which are separately packaged and interconnected. So let's look at what that would look like. You take a component crammed monolithic system and you split it apart. And that's the CHIPS program. That started about two years ago, about a year and a half ago. Right? And we're working with uh, Intel and some of the major players across this country to build an ecosystem where I don't have to design the entire monolithic uh, system. I can do 10% or 1% of a design and add that into an ecosystem that can make the overall system better. Now, this is a better way to do things, specifically for niche players, specifically for the DoD. Right? It lowers the barrier to entry to do a new design where you don't have to recreate every IP block at the most modern node. 
I can do a unique accelerator design, enter it into the mixture um, without having to bite off the entire complexity of the design. So that's better, but it's not an exponential on its own. But if you take a step back and you say, what does this mean? It means I can get back in the materials and processing game. I don't have to beat silicon. There's trillions of dollars investment in silicon. I don't have to invent a material that's better than silicon. I can complement silicon. Each one of these blocks right, can be done in, with unique processing steps, with unique materials. I can go vertical. Right? And that's the 3D SOC program we're kicking off uh, today. Carbon nanotubes, maybe they're the right answer, maybe they're not. Reram, maybe they're the right answer, maybe it's not. But we're demonstrating it from a 90 nanometer manufacturing base, a manufacturing base we have in many locations, including within the DoD. I can, by exploiting that vertical dimension, do better than a seven nanometer design. Not for every algorithm. When proximity and locality matter more than raw processing speed, then that interlacing of materials, memory, and processing together means those algorithms can be done incredibly efficiently, even if the transistors quite, aren't quite as good right, as if you did it in a monolithic block on its own. Stanford, MIT are, com are, are working together. Uh, they're working with a small company uh, in Minnesota, Skywater, um, to show what niche manufacturing can do to do leapfrog some of the capabilities at seven and five nanometers. You also then can look at alternatives to processing. This is work on the Frank program. In Frank, we're looking at novel materials and how can we use the eccentricities of these materials to be a part of the processing? Can I make an accelerator where I have non-volatile logic right, or non-volatile memory, or can I combine those things together with such efficient switching in my memory that logic and memory are actually sort of blended together? I don't have to replicate in um, across the entire model of the chip, I can actually just do it for one of these building blocks. All right, so we set us on a pathway that we're chasing to figure out how do you get new material to the mix. New materials being developed across this country is a pathway that starts to smell like a new exponential. But we still have design barriers and complexity barriers. He said, perhaps newly devised design automation procedures could translate from logic diagram to technical realization without any special engineering. So in 1965, he's sitting there in a lab looking at 50 transistors. And he's projecting that we're going to get to 65,000 transistors. And now we're at billions of transistors. And he described right, what we need to do today in terms of what actually Dr. Hennessy just uh, reminded we can do better uh, in EDA. So what does that look like? We kicked off the craft program. The craft program uh, represents a circuit design and software. Lines of code have been demonstrated that uh, from a line of code, I can create generators that then, uh, with minimal human interaction, create a physical device. Berkeley, with partners, um, Cadence, have demonstrated right, that their design teams of small teams of two to three graduate students can create, I would say, medium scale systems on chip infinitely faster and that I can now create variants of this chip and I can look at my data and my application and tweak those variables uh, and create a new system right, with orders of magnitude lower effort. Okay, so that's step one. That's doing things faster and we're on that pathway. Right? But that's not an exponential on its own. Faster doesn't get you uh, an exponential. You can do 100x better right, once, and you're still going to be run over right, by the expectations of, of Moore's law. So we started a program called IDEA. An IDEA is uh, intelligent EDA. And this is a pathway to an actual exponential. Everybody in this, in this room can be empowered to do a tape out and I can capture that information, capture that design information, and if I have intelligent EDA right, that learns from that data, then the next time we go do a design, right, you will be better off. Then you add that into the data mixture, 
and then the next time someone else does a design, they will be better off, and that is the basis of an exponential. We don't have that capability. We don't have EDA that learns from design, right? but IDEA is trying right, to figure out what that would look like. Again, you can't just do better. The legacy we've been handed is a 53-year exponential. You have to find new exponentials if we're going to society move it. Last but not least, we want to have the ethos of software, sharing results so they're not starting from scratch. You will not be able to capture an exponential unless you're standing on the shoulders of each other. Right? That is the basis of the feedback loop that will allow us to propel ourselves forward, we have to share. Well, why don't we share? And it's not because we're greedy and we just have a culture of, of proprietary development. It's because we don't trust the results unless we have intimate knowledge of how it was developed. We need a revolution in verification. Verification needs to uh, allow us to pull something off of an open source repository and use it with full faithfulness that is actually going to operate the way that it's supposed to. Okay. So that, I don't actually care if it's open source or not. I need to be able to design a system where I am not guessing. I'm not guessing how this is going to operate in my system, and we need a verification revolution to get there. And last but not least, we're exploring architectures. Similar to what Dr. Hennessy uh, described, we kicked off a series of programs to look at levels of spe specialization. Gordon Moore, this one got a squint a little bit more than in the other uh, uh, versions, but he did say, amortize the engineering over several identical items or evolve flexible techniques for the engineering of large functions. How do we reuse functional blocks in different ways inside of a, a circuit design? And we started with Hive. Hive looked at uh, collecting many DoD applications and looking at the data. And the data, it turns out, is oftentimes sparse. And we have GPUs that are very good for dense uh, processing. Um, but where it's sparse, we didn't have a, a good solution. So Intel and Qualcomm are doing the base level designs, working with our uh, soft, uh, universities and federal lab partners on the software hardware co-design so we can traverse a trillion edge graph, even though each of the nodes are sparsely populated. So that was step one. We started architecture exploration into this uh, level of specialization. But it turns out life is messy. It's not easy to characterize these data sets or sparse and or dense, right? They're complicated mixtures like this graph looks like. So we kicked off a program called Software Defined Hardware. Now the chip has the intelligence to know what it needs to be for the data that's flowing through it at that moment. We don't know how to do this, right? We're just starting this program, right? But we're is data introspection capabilities at the software level, reconfiguration in millisecond to microsecond timescales at the chip level so that you're near optimal independent of what the actual structure of that graph looks like. So for data analytics, we've got two programs, sparse and sparse and dense uh, systems that will uh, ease the use of how these chips will be used. And lastly, we looked at domain-specific SOCs. How do you write DSLs? How do you reinvent the way that we're going to use accelerators close to the sensors? Where we have massive amounts of data streaming through uh, the systems, how do you have domain-specific languages and representations of both the hardware all the way through the software so that it's easily reprogrammable, um, yet you enjoy the benefits of the specialization of those accelerators? So that's the three-legged approach towards the architecture wing. But wait, there's more. You know, three pages, every single sentence actually means something. Right? Which I, the brevity here right, is, is striking. Even the cartoon matters. So he's got a cartoon in 1965, handy home computers. He's describing PCs right, that are going to be sold in malls next to a cosmetic store. Right? This is. Uh, 20 years right, before the PC revolution in the 80s uh, and the 90s. And what he did there is a GIF describing the driving applications. Inventing right, without an end state right, is like pushing a rope. Right? You need a pull. Right? 
the PC pulled for a while. Right. Now we've got mobile that's pulling. We don't know what's pulling next. We'll try to get into that uh, on the next set of slides. But at the last line in this paper, right, uh, literally made me drop my pencil. He's describing the successful realization of such items as phase array antennas, for example, using a multiplicity of integrated microwave power sources to completely revolutionize radar. Radar, comms, all the electromagnetic spectrum is being disrupted right now by the use of silicon right, for millimeter wave arrays. In 1965, he's predicting the 5G battles that we're fighting right now in terms of where the millimeter wave space uh, is going to apply. All right, so we thought it'd be instructive right, to follow this cue and to show you some of what we think are the driving applications, a poke into the future. One great thing about working at DARPA is you get to see the future as it uh, emerges, and we want to share some of those driving applications with you uh, later tomorrow. We're going to start with N0. This is work pushing the absolute power limit to zero. How do I create systems which are intelligent and actually functioning, uh, but are in that 10 nanowatt class, right? two to three order of magnitude lower than where we're existing today. This is a 10 nanowatt neural net engine that University of Michigan has created. We use them for unattended sensors, so they'll operate now for years as opposed for days uh, or weeks, but also be the heart of IoT as we move forward. Trillions of devices right, will not exist in the world if it means trillions of batteries to change. Right? So going that next uh, revolution towards zero power operation, so you're either energy harvesting and or operating for batteries for years, right, is that next step, and we've proven that it's possible. Tomorrow, you'll be able to see the shield chip on display for one of its very first times. This is exploring the art of the small. 24 million chips on a 12-inch wafer. Right? Less than a penny per. So what are you going to do in that tiny space? The answer is a lot hundreds of thousands of transistors at your disposal, AES-256 encryption, X-ray sensors, light sensors, and things that we need to actually know where this tiny chip has been, right? and to provide authenticity. We have a real problem of authenticity in this world. Right? We need a physical tag right, that can be applied to events in the physical world that can label and stamp digital information. This could be a part of that solution, both from an anti-counterfeit perspective, but it's actually just scratching the surface of the overall meaning of having something uh, that you really trust in the physical domain. We'll describe Reimagine. Reimagine is a generation camera program. Everybody in the world is doing machine learning. They're learning on the data that the camera sends them. Right? We're not doing that. that you know, that's one where we get to let go and the rest of the world take over. We're asking a more foundational question. How do you ask the camera to give you the right information? How do you create that machine learning way up through the sensor so the sensor has saliency? I am not looking at every one of you right, at any one moment. Right? I am, uh, my brain has cognition. It tells my eyes where to focus. Today, our sensors just feed information in one way, a one-way flow. This will be the first time we explore how both RF systems and uh, EOIR systems or camera systems can have that built-in saliency. L2M. Uh, this is a program we kicked off when we realized there's nothing we can do in terms of efficient deep neural nets right, that isn't being done throughout the world. We're going to stop asking how to make efficient deep neural nets. We're asking the question, what can't deep neural nets do? Right? One thing they can't do is respond to surprise. They can't flag and say, uh, you should not trust me right now. The data that I was trained for is no longer valid. And we need to have that ability so we can trust our systems. And to, one way to do that is to have evolving networks, systems that are actually learning in the field right, that can respond when conditions change so you don't have to just rely on your training data Right, to know uh, whether it's going to be applicable for your current situation. We're also running SC2, Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. This is building such intelligence at the edge within 
uh, our sensor systems and our uh, radio systems that they know how to collaborate. Right, this uh, is a grand challenge that DARPA is running, right, where we're challenging the software-defined radio community and the machine learning community to figure out how would you impart edge intelligence that says, uh, without the FCC, without a spectrum manager, how would you all get along? Every one of our systems is going to get intelligence, right? either machine learning or otherwise uh, you know, uh, in intelligent code that allows it to make decisions. Each system is going to get smarter. Each self-driving car is going to get smarter. Each robot is going to get smarter. What we don't know how is an ensemble of independently trained systems are going to interact with each other. Spectrum Collaboration Challenge asks that at the microsecond scale. How are you going to figure out how to deconflict when you have a shared resource like the spectrum right, without uh, the human making that decision for you? And last but not least, SIF. I alluded to this. This is incredibly important for the initiative. We view hardware as part of the foundational solution for security. It is irresponsible for this community to run off and only focus on performance. There are things we can do at the hardware level that restrict the state space so that the software designers don't make the mistakes that have everybody in fear right now. Our government is more worried about cyber than we are about pushing forward with next generation electronics. And that's the right response right now because there's, we don't have proof that we haven't made mistakes. We need to have the foundation secure right, so we have a chance of getting the software right. And we need that foundation to help the software stack in uh, building in security. So Moore's Law has taken us an incredible way. We have a legacy. Uh, that is daunting. Finding a next generation exponential uh, is a DARPA hard thing. It may be too hard, right? but we will never have a better opportunity than we have right now. Congressional support, the PCAST uh, advice, great leadership up and down uh, our chain has empowered people in this community uh, to have the opportunity uh, to take the legacy that we've been handed and create a new legacy. We sit what I call Moore's inflection. The page two to page three flip right, is something that we need to harness and master just like we did right, the description on page two. We have the right people. We have an opportunity because the world's best and brightest minds still come to this country. We can tap into those best and brightest minds to lead us uh, to a better place. So I couldn't be more excited to be able to uh, kick this off. And so thank you. Uh, so much.